Welcome to A Regenerative Future. I'm your host, Matt Powers, and this is a podcast where we talk about what's possible, what hopeful solutions there are with partnering with nature for providing for people on into the future, living those ethics, living with integrity, healing the world as we heal ourselves. I'm Matt Powers. This is it. We're talking today with William Padilla Brown. William is inspirational. He is the founder of MycoFest. He is an author. He is a citizen scientist. He is the cordyceps guy. He's also the person that has taught so many people how to love mushrooms, how to see the world through new eyes. So I value his input, his teachings, and his insights so much. So please dive in. I know that there are some, you know, internet issues with this episode and I, I, I've edited some of it, but it's so worthwhile. The information is so valuable that I left a lot of it in so you could listen to it and hear all the parts because, I mean, man, when they're talking about some of the things about what he's doing with DNA, it's really incredible. Um, he's not genetically modifying things. He's genetically identifying things and then pairing them and then breeding new varieties based upon what he knows the outcomes will be. <laughs> so stay tuned, get excited, here we go. How are you all doing? Chilling. The cold Working. Still? Yeah. A little bit, I mean, springtime's showing its face and uh, ramps are starting to pop up and I'm sure the morels are soon to follow and hopefully by then they'll reopen the state parks and things like that. Um, luckily that didn't happen near me, but, uh, Westchester, uh, Chester County, the state parks are closed. Uh, um, you're not allowed to go hiking in there. Um, Whoa. so I mean, I gotta, I don't know, push people, it's going to push people to forage in other areas. I'm sure. That's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, we, we're, we have the ability to walk out of our house and go right into the woods. And I was like, I was like posting pictures of us doing that. And I was like thinking about it. I was like, not everyone can do this, Matt. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. But, but if you can, getting out there as much as possible, I think is the key um, for many of us to avoid just going crazy or falling into. Yeah, I went out on a hike. Uh, <laughs> went on a hike yesterday and there's a lot of people out in the forest. And I'm just like, what else are you going to do? You know, I mean, you can stay at home and play video games or go outside. I mean, everything's closed, like schools closed, like no gatherings over 50 people. Like one of the counties over near Philly is completely on lockdown. Like if, if anybody know, has to work so, outside the county, they have to stay there. It's so crazy because on the West coast, people are like still like everywhere and they don't think it's that big of a deal. Like a lot of people keep it's, saying that it's like not real, that it's a hoax. And I think they yeah. like watched the news three weeks ago and then stopped or something. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I like it is what it is, honestly. Um, as far as I've seen, major cities are like, you got to just stay out of there for now. Um, that's where the bigger issues are happening. Like Seattle, Philadelphia, New York City, like la is going nuts um but major cities is where there's going to be a lot of people from a lot of places come in contact with each other but like at the same time this is just the beginning like you know it's this is, it's not like this is going to go away and i feel like once you get it and you get your immunity to it after you if when you survive it um i think that's what's beneficial for folks um, cause I mean, once you, once you've already had it, you're not going to get it again, at least this year. I mean, it might be like the flu where it comes back again next year or whatever. That's what they're worried about. The, the coronaviruses typically have like only a few months of immunity. And then if it's not affected by the cold, then it will continue. And then Spanish flu, if you look at the way like statistically it works, um, the first year was smaller and then the second year was massive. The second winter, you know? And so mm -hmm. it might be that we're getting a warning and it looks scary, but we're getting a warning actually. This is just a scary warning for, to prep us for next year to be much more resilient and smart. Yeah. 
I mean, hopefully by next year, by the end of this year, there'll be like a decent cure for it. I mean, we can't just go throwing around cures right now because it takes so long to test for safety and all that kind of stuff. But I've really been thinking about um, Trad's experimentations that he did at Clemson University with the inoculating uh, strep throat into sterile mushroom cultures and they produced like the DNA specific antibiotic. Um, I think that that might be interesting to play around with right now. But one of the things that I've seen um, like a couple, like a week or so ago, I posted Stephen Buner, Buner's Wuhan protocol or whatever. Um, and people were like ripping me up. They were like, this is so irresponsible. Da, 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 da. Like people need to go to the doctors. Like people don't need to be taking herbal medicine at this kind of, for this kind of thing for treatment. And then all of the websites that had the Buner protocol for the Wuhan outbreak, um, they got emails from the FDA to take it down. So like, if you go look it up, there's like multiple things like FDA email, like you can't be selling like cures to the coronavirus or like products for coronavirus and things like that. So I'm just like, okay, like, but at the same time, I'm just, I've been preaching this for a couple years now. It's just like food is medicine. You know what I mean? Like prior to the Western influence on these holistic type products, the people that use them traditionally ate them. They weren't making capsules and tinctures and things like that. They were eating them. They were putting it in their food. Um, so I think that it's important to remember that food is medicine and to remember to include these medicinal type herbs and mushrooms in our, in our diet, um, more as a preventative than a reactionary, um, kind of, uh, pr precaution or, or whatever. Um, and I mean, that's something I've been saying since before this, but this whole time, I mean, I've been eating mushrooms like two, three times a day, you know, um, making sure to modulate my immune system properly, but I'm kind of ready for it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm kind of ready to just have it and get over it and have my little, however Fair long of, of immunity. Yeah. And like, I don't know. I mean, I feel like this like isolation is more so for hospitals than it is for the general public. Cause I feel like once the general public's exposed to it, then we all can like get past it faster, but like certain people are going to get it. And then certain people are going to be not getting it. And then those people that aren't getting it are going to get it later. I feel like it's like, everybody's going to get it at some point, you know? Um, you're right. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of like tired of talking about this. It's been the only thing that's been people been talking about for like two weeks now. And I'm just like, what else is good? You know, I've like got a lot of, I've some... got a lot of things to ask you about what you've been doing. So we we yeah. will jump off of there for sure. The, Do you mind if I run for a second? I need to um, turn off this, turn this pressure cooker down real quick. I'll be right back. Yeah. yeah. Cool. No It'll be like two minutes. <laughs> that was quick. Alrighty. <laughs> yeah, I just needed to turn it down. It was like right outside. Oh, that's hip. Yeah, so I I am a huge fan of traditional Chinese medicine. And when I heard, uh, we were, we've actually been prepared for this for weeks because mm -hmm. my wife's, you know, has has an immune system that's been compromised several times by cancer and radiation and all sorts of things. And so when the Chinese were saying that traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, was working better than like all the other things that they were trying, I mean, I just went right back to, you know, what, I, what I've always, you know, kind of, kind of trusted, which is herbs. And, and so I, on top of that, I use a lot of like fungi. So I'm taking cordyceps uh, twice a day. I'm taking reishi, um, uh, shiitake, maitake, lion's mane. We've got lion's mane and reishi tincture that we take. Um, I'm also taking things like selenium. It's funny though, the things that they're recommending are like half of them are uh, thyroid support. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been really low actually. And like, kind of like just cratering my energy for the past six months. I haven't, I, it's the first time I've been low energy in like 10 years actually. So it was really hard. I've been like me. done. I, like I've like, it was weird. Cause I was traveling as this was building up. Like I was in, Costa Rica and then I was in uh, LA, San Diego, then North Carolina. And then I came back and then they're all like, stop traveling, like stop all this stuff. So it was weird to be around, like rolling around during that um, whole situation. Um, and I've just been done since mm -hmm. then. Like 
Like, I don't feel like I'm like sick by any means. It feels more like Lyme. And that's something since I've like got my Lyme under control. Um, I've been ma- like kind of making sure that I don't overwork myself. Cause I used to do like four or five day long mushroom intensive courses where I'd be the only one teaching like nine hours a day for five days. And, and that used to trigger my Lyme. Like that would like, it's too much work on me. I would be done for like a whole week after that, just like laid out on the couch. So, um, I think that might be what it be, what it is just like remnants of my Lyme. Cause like, I don't necessarily think it's something that you'll ever get rid of until they figure out how, cause they form those little cysts when you start taking antibiotics and just like store in your fat or in your veins or whatever. Um, so I feel like every time I like overexert myself, then I get tired. I've been like recovering from that traveling experience and I'm like kind of just now getting back to, um, my, my regular state of energy. Um, but it really kind of takes me like, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling better. Although I did bust my knees yesterday trying to stop my kid from riding his bike into the street. Uh, <laughs> I like, fell down. I had a glass in my hand and I'm like running and like I just like go to grab him without breaking a glass in my hand and fell on my knees. Um, but yeah, so my knees hurt a little bit. But other than that, I'm I'm golden I'm down here in the that. lab um, getting some work done. So I, I'm really excited. I think probably the most exciting thing that could come out of this is that you or another um, citizen scientist could get the coronavirus and you, an experiment with it with fungi and get those, those very specific um, antibiotics that would actually fight it, right? Yeah, I mean, I could definitely give it a shot. Um, personally, I mean... Uh, if I get it, I'm I'm probably gonna take antibiotics or whatever the doctor gives me. I'm just like I'm not well, against. Remember Western the first week we're contagious, like, and so it's all yeah. about like feeling the heat in the throat and then coughing into the petri dish in time. I don't know. Yeah, I mean I'll definitely do it. I'm I'm definitely gonna like take a swab of my throat and yeah. stick it in some mushroom culture. Um, but at the same time, I'm probably I'll probably do what the what the doctors tell me right, to do because right. I I'm not a doctor by any means. Like oftentimes people come to me and they're like. I have this or my mom has that. Like, what do I do? And I'm just like, go to the doctor. Like I am not professionally trained in any, by any means. Like I know I've read research from different mushrooms and herbs and things like that, but that doesn't qualify me to tell you what to do. Like, and like, honestly, that could damage my career by like offering people medical advice, you know? So, um, and like same goes for myself. Like I know that these different herbs and mushrooms can do different things. And again, I use them more as a preventative than a reactionary thing. And if I do need to react, I'm going to go to the doctors. Um, and some people might like talk down on me for that. And other people are just like, you know, it's to each their own, you know, that's what I believe in. When I had Lyme disease, I tried all the herbal supplements and all the herbal remedies. I did the whole Buner protocol, everything to cordyceps, reishi mushrooms, all that. But it didn't work. It didn't stop anything until I took those gnarly, super potent gut ripping antibiotics. And afterwards I did kombucha and took their herbs and mushrooms to kind of like level it out. And that's when they work better. Like a lot of the, a lot of the mushrooms and things, I mean, like even everybody always references how Paul Stamets did the, the Ted med talk where he talked about how Turkey tail saved his mom. But like if people are actually listening to what he said, like she was taking cancer drugs with turkey tail and like i think that they work synergistically um so that's something to keep in mind yeah or what it does is it creates a buffer um so that you're buffered against the negative effects and we see that happen in the yeah. rhizosphere with plants all the time and and fungi doing that so it's not a leap actually for that to be the, be the reality so i have some questions here that I'm really excited about. So one of the things that I'm taking that I mentioned every day, um, and something that is also a thyroid support, something that is an immuno, you know, uh, immunologically uh, modulating supportive thing is cordyceps. And I mm-hmm. really didn't understand like how like like a whole, like, it's like almost like an order of magnitude greater. Um, how much more energy you get out of cordyceps than other mushrooms? Because a lot of people talk about, oh, you know, you're going to get energy from any sort of mushroom. 
you know, it's going to do this or that or the other. But Cordyceps is different. It's special. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. And I would like to talk about that today with you is to talk about why Cordyceps. Um, wh why is it special? Why, why do people need to know about this? And then I would like to know how, you know, you went through selecting your strain and your specific strain that you've, you've settled on and, and why you did that too. So where, where do I even start? Um, I mean, I've been working with cordyceps for years as like most people that follow my, my work, you know, um, and cordyceps have just been blowing my mind like the whole time. Um, so as far as like the energy goes, um, it's going to be cordycepin, which is uh, very similar to adenosine triphosphate. It's a um, three deoxy adenosine, um, which can be phosphorylated into mono dye and triphosphate in your cells. Um, and, uh, on, and like, that's what like most people are looking at, which has been really interesting to me because, um, it's kind of like, uh, THC and cannabis, like everybody's like, how much cordycepin? Like, what's up with the cordycepin? Um, and one of the things that I've been realizing as I've been writing about cordyceps is that there's a host of other compounds and, and other species specific unique compounds in cordyceps, uh, meaning that they only exist in these type of fungi in the whole natural world um, that are also super beneficial. Like this one, cordyman, uh, antifungal compound, uh, antimicrobial compound, but one of the more interesting things about it is there's multiple research studies that show that cordyman it, on its own and cordyman in conjunction with cordycepin um, have the ability to inhibit uh, um, HIV reverse transcriptase. So it can kind of like stop this virus from repli replicating, which is super powerful. Um, and they also have other antiretroviral uh, properties. So there's like all of these things about cordyceps that are Crazy. As far as the energy goes, it's mostly like the um, active compound there. Um, and cordycepin at high dose, high doses can actually be dangerous. So for bodies to get to that point where it's dangerous, but it can be like um, damaging. So yeah, that cordycepin goes into your cells, it provides you energy on a cellular level because your cells have a hard time differentiating cordycepin from adenosine triphosphate, which is utilized for cell respiration. Um, so it does that, and then it can also get more oxygen into our bodies, um, which is really helpful for active if we're moving. Um, it can slow down that um, lactic buildup in the muscles um, that happens when you get that you start to get that burn when you're working out for a long time. So it's more oxygen right in there, but it also could be good for people with um, uh, respiratory issues. Um, I was just sitting in a medicinals class uh, at the Organic Grower School in uh, Mars Hill University at Mars Hill University um, from a friend. Cornelia Cho, she's a pediatrician based in Atlanta, but she also works with medicinal mushrooms. Um, and I've talked to the Atlanta Mushroom Club on multiple occasions. Um, and one of the times I was there, there was a, I believe he's a traditional uh, Chinese medicine physician or doctor, uh, holistic doctor. Um, and he bought a bunch of cordyceps from me. And uh, she was telling a story about how um, uh, this family, they had a, a daughter, she's about four years old and she had sickle cell disease. Um, and they were traveling back to like Africa or something. Um, and, uh, they had their, their mother there. So the daughter, the little girl's grandmother, um, who had COPD, um, and he traveled with them and was able to utilize cordyceps mushrooms to aid both the, the grandmother with COPD and the child with sickle cell. Um, so I think that that's really awesome to see these kind of, um, real world applications, um, especially because there's so many people that like believe that mushrooms really don't have like medicinal properties, which mostly comes out of the fact that there's, there's not funding for medicinal research in with mushrooms in the United States. So like all of the research comes out of different countries, mostly Asia. There's some good research coming out of Europe and Spain. Uh, Spain has had some really cool uh, uh, mushroom research uh, done. There's just, there's just so much and so much more to be uncovered. And like, it's part of the reason why I've been trying to, um, get so much, uh, to get funding, get grants and things like that, to be able to do research that I think is going to be beneficial. Um, cause there's other people that are going to just do this research that don't have as much background 
um, with these mushrooms and they're just going to research basic things that have already been done. Like there's a lot of research show that shows the same kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, what are we going to do? Um, just keep growing more cordyceps and, uh, doing self exploration, I guess. Um, right now I'm, the pressure cooker that I went to go stop, um, is full of cacao beans that I'm going to be growing cordyceps mycelium on for like a mycelial fermentation. Um, so they're fresh. They have the pulp on it still. So I'm not going to do like the pulp, like fermentation method. Um, I'm going to just do this fermentation method with the cordyceps, which I've done before. Um, and I, and I ran it to fruit, um, which they didn't fruit that well, but I was able to get fruiting bodies off of it. But one of the things I found for like consuming mycelial medicine, which is really beneficial, which we could, should talk about that because there's a lot of debate about it, um, is that you shouldn't let it grow that long. Like um, mycelium it is capable of harboring other organisms that might not be as beneficial. So just do like a quick fermentation, not let it go to fruit. Um, and then whip up some chocolate or do some liposomal extractions, which is something else we should talk about. Cause it's like super powerful. Um, you should definitely get Cornelia Cho on your, on your podcast. Cause like, she's been doing more work with the liposomal extractions. Are you familiar at all? Um, was with, she uh, at Microfest? She was at, no, she wasn't at Microfest. She will be at this coming one. Well, um, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm not familiar with her, but I'm excited to learn more. Yeah, she's been doing a lot of work with lion's mane mycelium, blending it with oil. Um, and like the first time I tried it was probably like four years ago or so. And she just took some uh, lion's mane mycelium, blended it up with like olive oil and water. And it was disgusting. And it's it had like already at that point had been shown to be beneficial. Um, the way that the oil coats the, the micronized bits of mycelium it allows some of it to be digested in your stomach but some of it to pass down into your intestines where it's absorbed um in a different le at a different stage um versus being all uh, digested and absorbed in your stomach really um good. but now she does like a little coconut milk and a little like fruits and uh, uses a different oil because when you do the olive oil it gets rancid really quick by the aeration of the blender um so like there's other oils that that do better because like rapid oxidization ox tastes way better and is able to get into more people. And um, they've been seeing a lot of benefits for people with like Alzheimer's and like other nerve damaging uh, issues, um, which the results I can't speak to. Um, I just heard it the other day, but um, it's not something that that's stuck enough for me to be able to like recite the numbers and the results and all that kind of stuff. But she'd be able to do that. And uh, she's way more savvy with that kind of stuff. But um, I'm definitely going to be working with more liposomal fruit body and mycelium uh, combination, uh, um, kind of see how that rocks out. I mean, that's something we've been doing with cognitive function too, with like putting the mushrooms and the mushroom extracts into oils so that they can penetrate deeper into the body. Um, so, I mean, we're kind of riding that wave a little bit, you know, getting away from, uh, tinctures and capsules and making it more something that you cook with and eat with, like eat in your food to kind of bring people back to food, food as medicine, you know? Um, but yeah, there's lots of really interesting things going on in the world of medicinal mushrooms. Yeah, I tried, we tried the mushroom milk. I didn't use the mycelium as much as I used the mushrooms with the olive oil and uh, in the blender and the, with, with, uh, water and you press it through the sieve and it, my son threw up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it is really, yeah, really, it's gross. really gross. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm glad that someone is tinkering on this and is brave enough to go into that space because the benefits, I read the patent and the, the case studies on the patent are incredible. I mean, it's like FARS, it's like Alzheimer's, um, MS, like the, the, there are all these people that have experienced anecdotal benefit. And so mm -hmm. the impetus to do the work, to do the studies um, and to get that, those grants connected is, is absolutely there. So I'm so grateful that you and, and Cornelia Cho are doing this work. And same thing with Trad Cotter too. Um, Trad's done so much research. So there's a lot of people involved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, we're all trying to get to that point. I mean, not only is it benefit 
beneficial for the economics of, of mushroom farming, but um, it's beneficial to the global community to know that there's these things that you can just go find outside that have incredible benefits. Because um, a lot of people won't won't mess with it unless they're, it's like scientifically backed, you know. Um, or a pill. <laughs> Yeah, or in a pill, you know, we got, I mean, we got to figure out the best forms to like get it to people and like make it sexy, you know, that's something um, I was, I was sitting on a panel, uh, Farming While Black panel in North Carolina, like last week um, with Leah Penniman and um, this dude, Pork Ryan, he's kind of funny and uh, he like farms pigs and um, let's see, uh, this gentleman from Golden Organic Farm and another gentleman that was working in Asheville. Somebody was asking, like, how do we we have this farmer's market that we started doing from home and, like, how do we get more people there? I was like, you got to make it sexy. You got to make it cool, you know? Um Mm-hmm. people have such a short attention span and they're not here for the, you should buy kale because it has this benefit and that benefit and da, 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 da. And like, no, we want to see like eating some kale on their Instagram story for 15 seconds. And they're like, yo, I'm going to do that. That looks cool. You know what I mean? Um, so I've been like, yo, you just got to make it sexy. You got to make it cool. And that's been like a big approach over the past couple years with my work. Cause like, I used to just be this, the nerd kid, like walking around those shoes on super hippie dippy looking like you should eat kale and maca and reishi mushrooms and chai. So cool. And then I found more pe- people were more receptive and uh, I was able to grab more attention um, with just kind of like not doing that. Like going back to my roots, wearing my streetwear, going to these events with my gold tooth in and my little rings crystals on it and stuff like that and like cool um and making it cool um so i found a lot of 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 receptiveness with that i mean because like attention is currency right now like if you can grab people's attention the longer you can have people's attention the more likely they are to actually listen the more likely they are to to change their their way of thinking um but it it takes time i mean this that not a lot of people have like people don't want to be talked at or talked to people don't want permaculture experts it's going into inner city saying that you live in a food desert and this is a food apartheid and I can fix it for you. Like, you know, and like on top of that, some of the other things that I added was like cooking. Like I'll teach people to grow mushrooms, but then I'll also prepare a dish or I'll have a chef come in and prepare a dish because like, especially when I'm working in these inner cities, like I'm teaching people to grow ingredients that they don't have any tradition of using or haven't, used uh before so like you can teach them to grow it but then they're like like then what you know um so i think cooking and making it cool and sexy is like the way to go about it so i don't know i I lose like i lose probably like a hundred or so followers every week because of my approach so it's it's going up but it's also like people like expect me to be like some super holistic like vegan scientist guy and then they see me like bumping rap music in my basement while I'm like doing all this stuff for like whatever you know like I get a tattoo I lose followers I put a gold tooth in my mouth I lose followers but then I also gain people that need it more than those people obviously you know because people want something that's relatable so I'm trying to be that like bridge you know which I think Mm -hmm. is important absolutely and I think you are that bridge. I feel like there's a transition happening. I, I experienced that actually when I stopped being a musician. I had over 10,000 more followers on Twitter. So I've watched yeah. my audience like go all the way down and then come back up. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and that's just, you know, I, think, I, I feel like people want you to be one thing. And then when you're like, well, I'm actually a musician and I'm a citizen scientist and I'm a dad and, and it, it, People it makes want it a mirror. Harder. What? Yeah. No, I'm just agreeing. Like people, people really want that mirror. They want to see in you what they want to see in themselves, you know? And when you don't reflect that completely, they're just like, nah, get out of here. Yeah. Um, and like, 
I don't know. I don't know how many people are ready for that multidimensional human. Like a lot of a lot of what's represented through social media is like a really one sided thing. And like I think a lot of that comes out of fear of losing your your online following, like which is like a really big deal for a lot of people. They're like my pe- my followers want to see this, so this is what I'm going to deliver. And you know, I think that the people that are like kind of tuning in and like waking up to like themselves, like coming aware of themselves are like, I want authenticity. And like, that's something that I feel like is like a funny word for to use right now because like, so I was like, I have authentic tacos. I have authentic mushroom products. I have authentic herbalism. I, like, I'm an authentic person. And I'm just like, but like, I think, I think, people are really searching for that authenticity. They're really searching for somebody that's like for people that are just not afraid to like be and express themselves as they are. Um, instead of like putting on this facade, like I'm just this permaculture guy and everything that I'm putting out is just all permaculture and da 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 da. Like I eat, sleep and like use permaculture to wipe my butt. You know what I mean? Like, and it's like, I don't know, like I don't really, I, I don't know too many people that are like just one thing, you know? like we're multifaceted as human beings and i think it's important to um explore it's weird to like keep going back to the whole social media thing but like that is socializing nowadays especially in a time like this when like literally you just got to stay at home like that is socializing um but a lot of people a lot of people especially in my generation have developed a lot of social anxiety um probably based around the technology that we grew up with and have have more of a hard time and things like that are really important to like bring people together and um, expose people to other things but like social media is important and it, it's a critical form of, of socializing like especially now when we're all quarantined like pe- this way people are socializing but a lot of millennials that utilize social media more have and I mean, I don't know if that's something you saw with, with your generation or with our parents generation and things like that. But like, there's a lot of kids that just have all sorts of like anxiety around people, around talking to people, around communicating, around being in crowds, um, mm-hmm. where I find that that's important. But I also think that like festivals kind of break that uh, for people when they just go immerse themselves in these events to like be with their friends and like like listen to this music and take substances that make them more open to communication with other people and things like that, which I think it's, is really important. <laughs> but yeah, I've just been kind of going on a tangent talking about all sorts of stuff. It's all good. Yeah, no, I think it's very human. I think that the gathering and that's part of what we're dealing with right now is that everyone wants to get together. Everyone wants to go and see each other and touch each other and <laughs> And this whole isolation thing is very difficult for us to like grasp, especially the idea of doing this for months. Um, I think that is like, seems just, it seems impossible to our minds. We're like on isolation for months. What, you know, it's, it doesn't come out really. Yeah. I mean, our society really like is demanding of like an externalization of your senses and your consciousness is like always yeah out and received which a lot of people have never done in their entire life is reflect on themselves and like a lot of people are just going to be inside like stimulating themselves listening to music watching television playing video games like they're not going to like really take that time to like go inside but um i think that the decriminalization of plants and the legalization of of cannabis in particular around the country will aid in that i mean i know there's a lot of people that are just going to go home and utilize a lot of cannabis which you utilize a lot of cannabis you're going to sit on your butt and reflect inwards for a little bit it's just the fact of the matter and like i feel like a lot of people that are going to be stuck at home they're like I don't got to go to work today. I'm going to, I'm just going to use a lot of cannabis and they're just going to be like, (laughs) like, like, Oh man. Yeah. I agree. So 
speaking of cordyceps, tell us about this ultimate strain you're working on because you've been you've been working like the ultimate strain? different wi wild strains to create this ultimate strain that you're choosing to be the one that you cultivate, right? Right. I haven't specifically settled on one yet. I've had so okay. many options like I found over 200 specimen of cordyceps wild last year, um, which I took a little bit of a different approach than my friend that also breeds cordyceps. Um, he takes wild strains and collects the spores from the wild strain and then starts working with them, which is a little bit more effective for almost all the strains that I brought in. And I attempted to produce fruits from clones, which anybody that's been following has probably noticed that I'm not producing cordyceps at commercial scale right now. And I haven't done that in over half a year. Um, because when you bring in wild strains as clones, any mushrooms. But the ones that did produce mushrooms are the ones that I then selected for in, indoor cultivation. So the ones that produce mushrooms, I collected spores from them. Um, and then I taught myself how to do molecular biology in like a couple weeks with really good results. Not like any in-depth molecular biology. I just taught myself how to extract and amplify DNA and read gel electrophoresis and send in samples for sequencing and things like that. Um, I also did go to the uh, New York Genomic Center and took a class on uh, nanopore sequencing, which I'm really excited about. And if everything clears up by May, I'm going to be going to a conference on nanopore sequencing in London. Um, but uh, that's the whole next level thing. That's actually like doing sequencing from home or like in the forest or literally wherever you are in a bathroom somewhere in a hotel room in the Arctic, in the, in the mountain, in a cave, wherever you are on a ship somewhere, you can do <laughs> full genome sequencing with a little device the size of a, of a stapler. So I went and took a class on that, um, which was fairly expensive. And it was interesting to be in a crowd of like people that were there from like government funding and like from universities like some kid stuff and I had literally just taught myself how to like use pipettes and like read like my results and stuff I love like it. that so <laughs> it was like a little overwhelming but really that and I taught myself how to do PCR and read gel electrophoresis and so what I did um, is I started isolating spores with my microscope I'd look in my I'd drop spores on a petri dish I'd look at it under my microscope until I could uh, a culture that's capable of producing fruit, fruiting bodies. Um, so I didn't want that. I wanted individual spores so that I can breed them together and look at their genetics. Like I can see like, oh, this or from this one has these qualities. So if I want this kind of strain, I need to breed this spore with this spore. So the way that you have to do that because cordyceps is a bipolar heterotholic fungus. It's a sex, sexual orientation of the fungus, um, which is good for breeders because some mushrooms have thousands of mating types. Cordyceps only has three, or militaris only has three. Um, and there's like two different uh, mating type locusts um, in the DNA. And one of them has one mating type, the other one has two. If I just took all of my individual spores and put them together, um, there's 50% chance that they'll make a culture that produces fruiting bodies and another 50% chance that won't do anything because I mated them with themselves. So in order to prevent that 50% failure uh, rate, I took all the individual spores and I ran their DNA through the PCR and read them on gel electrophoresis to see what their mating type was. So I just did that all in my basement and like found the little bits of DNA for me um, send them to me in the mail, like the next work. Um, then I bred them together and like had a hundred percent success rate of producing fruits, which dramatically decreased the time that I needed to like figure out what they were capable of doing. Um, so with that being done, I took all these strains, X, this, this, X, this, this, X, this, and then I've kept everything, notes of everything to see, um, what, the characteristics they had and I found and starred. So the ones really good. Um, so those are the ones that I'm going to be running for commercial pr production this year. And, and I'm already, um, they look like this to sell to people online with the best producing strains that I developed yeah. this winter. Um, and it's like an ongoing process. I mean, my friend Ryan Gates is just taking it to the next level. Like he's breeding like Japanese ones, with like French ones and like all this kind of stuff, which is incredible. Like I'm just breeding ones with like within like a 60 mile radius of each other, you know, within just in a 60 mile radius. But like 
who knows if ones from France would have ever come in contact with ones from Japan. Because, wow. like, it's insane. Like, two little spores from a little mushroom that needs to land on a little insect. Like, the, the possibility that these genetics would have ever combined is, like, almost impossible. Um, so to see these genetic variations that are being produced by myself and other people breeding cordyceps is, like, really phenomenal. And, like, for those of us that understand how incredible it is, it's, like, living art so yeah for yield and beautiful looking fruiting bodies like nice color because like some of them are yellow like some of them are really pale orange almost yellow looking and some of them are really dark orange so like i like the dark orange with like a long fruiting body um so that's what i'm trying to get out there but i think as we get access to more funding um then it'll shift more towards breeding um so then we can like breed those like high course even producing strains or like High human producing strains or high uh, higher production of, of nucleotide bases for molecular biology work or whatever um, whatever anybody wants, but um, we don't have really tools to be doing that right now. So most of us are just breeding it for like yield potential. Um, so yeah, that's what I've been working on all winter when I'm home, which has been hard because. We- when you're doing the breeding stuff, you've got to be home for like a couple of weeks. And like, I make my money, like I, this doesn't pay the bills. Like this yeah. is just passion project. Like, um, selling the cultures, like maybe I'll pay my phone bill or keep the water on, but like rent's expensive and to keep up with that, I have to travel and teach, which is like right now, like what the heck am I going to do? You know, like I'm stuck at home. I can't go travel and teach big events right now. So I'm trying to figure out how to keep the bills or the house paid for and all that kind of stuff. Um, which I'm not entirely worried about. Like I've chosen not to worry about the financial mentality and, you know, I mean, none of my bills have not gone paid, so I'll just keep rocking out that way. But, um, yeah, more, more passion project. Um, and because of my, my work that, that I use for keeping up with everything, it keeps me away from like being able to do this at the level I really want to. Um, so again, why I'm looking for like funding, mostly grants, cause I don't necessarily want to pay people back because what I'm doing is not like super lucrative. Um, cause I'm not trying to like start some big large scale production business, which would be cool. Um, and I, I, maybe I'll do that sometime down the road and hire people to run that. But like, that's not what I want to do with my time. Like I don't want to be spending my time growing a bunch of mushrooms when I could be in the lab figuring out how other people can grow something new or like grow something better. I feel like that's where my time is better spent, um, which puts me in a weird predicament sometimes. I feel the same. Um, So, I I mean, like I do so much research that I find that the research alone doesn't always have actual application immediately to what I'm working on or writing or anything. And that's okay. (laughs) Science, they're trying to understand the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's a journey. And I was thinking about, um, could you use the same sequencing protocols for all, like all different mushroom strains and then breed um, and develop um, higher, like uh, more desirable traits in other mushroom strains? And are you- Yeah, 100%. Um, if time allows, you know, I, I'm, I'm down to do all this kind of stuff. Some of them are a little more difficult cause they have more intricate meeting types and, um, all that kind of stuff. Like Ganodermas are a little bit harder to breed. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. I'm here to figure it out. I mean, there's other larger companies that have been breeding mushrooms for a long time. And like, that's where we get our commercial producing strains from, um, so like I'm here for it. Um, I'm I'm more interested in doing things that haven't been done or haven't been worked on. It's so like working with mushrooms that are like under researched. Um, like what I have about, one in particular, Globifomies gravio lens. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I um, but yeah, there's that. this one called yeah. There's a sweet knot polypore that has no research done on it. It's called Globifomies gravio lens. I uh, one of my pictures I took of it was published in not the last fungi magazine, but the one before it. Um, But I did have a really interesting thing on DNA, if anybody's interested on the breeding thing that I just talked about. I published an article in Fungi Magazine that came out in the last issue. Um, If anybody wants to get that magazine, check it out. But um, 
this mushroom globby foamy's gravia lens has no research on it and it gets a polypore um so polypores are generally safe there's like two species of polypores that are can be harmful um and uh so I, i've tried it i've made tea with it and drank it and it's very pleasant and my friends have cultivated it so um it's cultivatable um it makes a tea that's pleasant and i'm sure that I mean, we know it has polysaccharides, which are immunomodulating, but I want to know what else it's doing. Um, so that, that's the kind of stuff I'm interested in is like finding mushrooms that are under-researched, figuring out what's good with them, seeing if they're cultivatable, um, then bringing that to the general public who are already cultivating mushrooms who could be cultivating a new varietal or a variety that could be distributed and maybe be beneficial for people um, in times where people are getting sick or preventing people from getting sick or just being something good to eat. Like, you know, um, all that stuff is important. And, uh, that's where I want to spend my time is just researching the unknown and, uh, exposing people to new realities. So speaking of exposing Cause other people, people do the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of introducing um, people to things, um, your book on cordyceps cultivation is coming out soon, right? Yeah, that's been like way bigger of a task than I've anticipated. Um, I I pre I pre uh, um, I released I, I I posted a release date way too soon because um, I said it was going to come out in February and it's now March. So, um, but yeah, I really wanted to elevate the book because my last two publications were very remedial. Mm -hmm. um, in information, but also in like visual aesthetic. So like, I'm really trying to format it in a way that's very appealing to look at and something that's nice to hold and, and the pictures are beautiful and like all that kind of stuff. So like doing that from the stance of like self publication is kind of, uh, hard. Um, uh, but it's being formatted and edited for print and it'll be in print very soon. Um, the whole context of the book, the content's done, but just like making sure that it looks really good is what we're working on right now. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that book is just going to blow the last one out of the water. There's so much information in it. So many new techniques for cultivation, like trying to get the world growing the cordyceps, getting the cordyceps to the right people. Um, so maybe it'll get in the hands of somebody that's more capable of doing the research than I am. Um, uh, that red has has more access to the tools necessary to do the research um is my hopes um so yeah that that'll be coming out really soon and then i have a couple other uh publishers that are asking me to write other books um so that's something to keep an eye out for um, nice yeah i love it yeah buddy <laughs> And, and, and then we mentioned it earlier, but MycoFest. Yeah, MycoFest 2020. It's July 31st to August 2nd in Airville, Pennsylvania on like 200 or like 100, no, 130 something acres of land, mostly forested. There's private cabins, there's communal cabins, there's tent camping, there's a hammock village, there's a creek with waterfalls, there's it connects the land connects to the Susquehanna River, also connects to the Mason Dixon Trail. So there's like hiking that we can do off site, but really. All of the forays are probably going to happen on site because there's a lot of diversity of tree species, which means there's going to be a diversity of mushrooms on the land. Um, big lodge space for all the speakers. You, anybody can send in a speaker application. Um, big lodge space for all of the talks. Um, we're really elevating it this year. Like the venue is like way more accommodating than previous venues. Um, a lot of big fire pits. We're going to be cooking outside. We're going to have private dinners with like amazing chefs. Um, uh, food trucks at lunch, breakfast and dinner are taken care of. Um, lots of classes. We're going to have a sustainability track this year. Um, kind of put an emphasis on like self care and like t taking care of your community or helping the community take care of itself. Um, yeah. Uh, a lot of kids events to so bring the family along and hopefully, um, by that time, it'll be okay to meet up in groups of that size. But either way, I think it's important um, medicine for the people, you know. Um, so, yeah, MycoFest, definitely check it out. Definitely apply to volunteer. Apply to be a speaker. Um, 
grab your tickets. There's only a couple weeks left of early bird tickets. So um, definitely jump on that. Um, yeah. Sixth year going strong. I love that. <laughs> so what would you say to um, someone who is just starting out, someone who wants to get involved with growing mushrooms as a business? What would you say that their first step should be? Grow some mushrooms in your house. <laughs> grow whatever variety you want to grow. Put it on your on your counter in your kitchen and see what it takes to grow it. Um, start small. Maybe get a little indoor hydroponic tent. Set it up with all the fixins for cultivating mushrooms, which you can find everywhere online. There's so many videos on YouTube. There's the mushroom growing group on Facebook. Um, get a uh, book from Paul Stamets or Trad Cotter has a lot of great information on cultivating. Start with one species, um, start small, allow the production of that mushroom to pay for the equipment to upgrade. Um, don't go too big, too fast. Um, because if you mess up, then it's probably going to be disheartening. Um, so yeah, just slow, slowly by slowly figure it out. Um, I mean, even like a four by four grow tent in your basement's more than enough to produce for your home and for a couple other people. So, um, I mean, it doesn't take that much to grow mushrooms. Like I have a small shed that can produce up to like 150, 200 pounds of mushrooms a week if I stacked it up properly. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, just get started small. Start with one species. Once you get the hang of that, maybe add in another one that can grow in the same, um, uh, environmental requirements and, uh, yeah, have fun. You know, it's a fun thing to do. Don't overwork yourself at the beginning because uh, mushroom farming is requires labor. So, you know, it's going to become a full-time job if you take it to that level. That's what I did. It worked out for me. So, yeah, I'm sure it could work out for other people. Awesome. So, where can we learn more from you? Uh, yeah, just stay tuned. If you're on Facebook or on Instagram, or even at uh, mycosymbiotics.net, there's my calendar um, where you can see all the places I'm going to be. So I'm usually all over the place. I might be in a city near you sooner than later. Even if it's not in the United States, I'm starting to do more international teaching. Um, yeah, so just stay tuned to the calendar. Find out where I'm going to be. Come to one of the classes. Hang out. Um, I usually chill with people afterwards. So if you want to like hang out and talk about other stuff, more than welcome to do that if you come to one of the events. So, um, yeah, I'm all over the place. It's not, I'm not hard to find, not hard to get a hold of. And, um, I'm, I'm ready to share, uh, what I know to help everybody progress. You know, that's what I'm here for. So yeah, reach out. Thank you so much, William. Yeah. Thank you, man. I hope that you liked that episode. William is amazing, isn't he? I appreciate him so much. And he always makes time to include me in his events like my Go Fest if I can make it over to there to that coast or to, to talk to me over, over Skype or over the internet or over the phone or even over text. He is one of the people that are masterminding the end of my new course, Regenerative Entrepreneurs and Experts 2020. This is an online course, how to become a regenerative entrepreneur online. All the skills that you need to do to start your business, to launch yourself to a whole nother level. And William is going to be talking to us about how he did it and, and answering questions, working in a mastermind with a small group of people. And that is the kind of like one-on-one -on -one feedback that a lot of people need. They need that interaction. And so that's what we're having. We're having masterminds at the end of my course. So people get their business plan together and they get their launching plan together, their marketing plan, their social media plan, their crowdfunding plan, their scaling plan. And then they present their ideas. And then we get, we have masterminds with niche experts who are living that entrepreneurial dream right now. So you get to run your eyes, ideas like in a shark tank, you know, and then you get to talk to the actual experts one on one afterwards and ask your questions. So this is an incredible opportunity. William is one of them. Rich on is another. I have many other people that are, are, are asking to be part of this. And so it's going to be an incredible time. This is an incredible time of learning, an incredible time of growth as we're all 
you know, lockdown and, and, and pandemic mode. If you, you know, have your health, if you have your food storage, if you uh, did the social distancing thing in time, you should be fine. And, and that's kind of where many of us are. We're just trying to keep out of the problem. You're trying to prevent, you know, the spread. And so we're not going to get sick. We're going to, you know, be here in our lockdown and we're here to learn. So we come out of this situation with our dreams being the thing that guides us to a new level, with a new business, with a business plan, with business partners, with a vision on how to change your business into a regenerative one. All these things are possible for you today, right now. Actually, speaking of today, right now, I've got a free course for regenerative entrepreneurs right now called Making It Happen. It's a free course. You can click the link down below and check it out. There are hundreds of people that have taken regenerative entrepreneurs and experts, and they have launched their businesses, and you can too. So check out the link below, check out the free course, check out the course that's coming up in April and get excited because change is in the air. Things are possible. I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily and live regeneratively. 